Modi? Modi? Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this evening's event. My name is Phil Hodgson and I'm a Professor and Dean of Social Sciences Education at Leeds Trinity. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. In addition to the audience here uh, who are present at this inaugural event, we've got a number of colleagues and uh, friends joining us on a uh, live stream. Um, what was it, live stream? Uh, live stream, sorry. Welcome to you all. Um, this evening, the university is very proud to present the next in our series of inaugural professor, professorial lectures, which welcomes professors to Leeds Trinity and provides a platform for their specialisms. This follows recent investment by the university in its academic leadership and structures to support the delivery of the strategic plan, which was launched in 2021. Some of you will be aware that research, impact and innovation is a key strategic pillar of this plan. Since gaining university status in 2012, Leeds Trinity has built its rich research culture, which has been in place since uh, 1966 and its, its inaugural foundation. Our university staff continue to contribute to our reputation for excellent, excellence in applied research and research-led uh, research culture that enhances our students' learning experiences. Our inaugural professorial lectures will give you a flavour of this. Before I hand over to Professor Alex Nunn, who will introduce uh, Professor David Best, please be aware that we're not expecting any fire drills. So if the alarm does sound, please use the fire exits to the side of the room and go to the nearest evacuation point. In addition, the closest toilets are just down the corridor, and if you need to find them, please ask some of our ambassadors who are here tonight. After tonight's lecture, we hope you'll join us for refreshments in the atrium. Thank you. Without further ado, uh, Professor Alex Nunn. Thank you, Professor Hodgson. And good evening, everybody in the room and also online. You're very welcome to join us tonight. I'm Alex Nunn. I'm Professor of Social Policy and Dean of Research here at Leeds Trinity. And it's my absolute honour to introduce for you tonight our inaugural lecture from Professor David Best. David is a professor of um, addiction recovery research, and he's also a director of our new Centre for Addiction Recovery Research, which we hope will build uh, a long-standing track record of research around David's work. David was born and educated in Lanarkshire, just outside of Glasgow, and he went on to study at Strathclyde University and the London School of Economics. And following that, worked at the Institute of Psychiatry, the National Treatment Agency for Substance Misuse, Monash University in Australia, and several other universities in the UK before joining Leeds Trinity in uh, 2022. One thing I should pause and say there is, David has been a professor for nine years, and this is his first inaugural lecture. And we're really, really pleased that that is happening here at Leeds Trinity. Outside of his work with the university, David holds many prestigious uh, positions. He's director of the British Society for Criminologists Prison Research Network. He was recently appointed as an affiliate senior scientist at the Public Health Institute in California. He's on the board of the National Alliance of Recovery Residences in the United States, and he holds several professorial positions at the Australian National University and Monash University, uh, again in Australia. On a personal note, my job is to look after research here at the uh, Leeds Trinity, and I spend a lot of my time encouraging people to think in terms of, uh, about their research in terms of excellence and world leadingness in uh, rigor and originality and significance, and all those things are important. And tomorrow I'll be back on that. And David's work ticks all those boxes uh, in abundance. But that's about games that universities play. And they're important games, but they are games that universities play. David's work is excellent in those terms, but also in the difference it makes to people's lives. It supports people in recovery to understand that process and to improve their recovery outcomes. It supports recovery services to improve the services that they offer to people uh, and to Im improve the outcomes that they get. It generates a virtuous cycle, a virtuous circle between people's experiences and the, and the services that they receive. But more than that, 
It's like a stone being thrown in a lake. It generates ripple effects that go on to affect those people's uh, families, affect wider public services that, that they may use or may not use in the future, affects repeat uh, spells uh, in recovery, and generates in, uh, better employment outcomes and potentially tax revenues also. This is really, really important research that ticks a box in terms of excellence, and I'm sure David will, will talk to you about uh, methods and uh, and, and all that academic stuff, but it also makes a real difference to people's lives. And that's the thing that I love uh, about it uh, the most. So it's really my honor now then to uh, ask you to join with me uh, in welcoming Professor David Best to give his inaugural uh, professorial lecture. First, look, can I just say thank you all so much for coming today. I, I really appreciate it. It is an honour for me. It's taken a long time, as Alex said. I first became a professor in 2014, and this is the first time I've done this. So this is a huge honour for me. Um, I guess what I, what I want to talk about really falls under three primary themes that are not really about addiction recovery. They are much broader than that. The first is about connection and community. The second is about social justice. And the third is about transitioning from deficits models to strength-based models. And they are the core themes. Now, I am going to take the slightly unusual step of starting my lecture, if I can get moving. There has to be. Uh, we, we practiced this earlier and still I can't strip. So I'm going to start with a song. But fortunately for all of you, I am not going to sing it. Uh, I'm going to explain what this is as soon as this is. Oh, I'm going to explain what this is as soon as it starts. Um, oh, no, it's. I did say to all the technical people I would mess this up, and I have done. <laughs> Go. No. Uh, just click with the mouse on the The lyrics are on there if you want to join in. Sing along. Oh, uh -huh. 
Right, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> so, why did I play this? Well, uh, I started working in the addictions field in the early 90s. And in 1995, uh, I moved from Scotland to London to take up a position at the National Addiction Centre. And at that time, basically what we had was a treatment system that was predicated on medicines and talking therapies. And the notion of recovery was generally considered to be wishful thinking and laughable. The idea that somehow you could possibly have a scientific approach that talked about God, spirituality, and a group of middle-aged blokes sitting around in church basements drinking stewed coffee as an, an appropriate response was just laughable. So for any of you who don't know what the serenity prayer is, it is strongly associated with the 12 step movement. And over the course, so where, where did I first hear this song? So now if you go to a drug court in Auckland in New Zealand, every single session of that court starts with singing the serenity prayer in Maori. And that's what that was. Everybody from the judge onwards stands up and sings. Why? Because there's a recognition that recovery is the fundamentally transformative process and that we need to be serious about accommodating things like spirituality as a core part of that process. And effectively, I think my academic journey mirrors the journey of the recovery movement from something that was seen as almost like cult-like mystique through various transitions that I will try and describe over the next four and a half hours or so. You think I'm joking? Uh, so, and, and one of the things that transformed this, and I'm a psychologist, but I'm not a very good one, and I'm about to be incredibly disloyal to my home uh, discipline, is that by far the biggest ever study undertaken in the addictions field was called Project Match. And Project Match involved around 1,500 alcoholics who took part in this incredibly intensive process of a randomized trial where people were randomized to one of three conditions. They either got cognitive behavioral therapy, the gold standard of talking therapies, or they got a manualized version of motivational interviewing, a very much an up and coming therapeutic approach at that time, or a manualized version of 12 step therapy what was called TSF or 12-step facilitation. It was called Project Match because the aim of the study was to say, can we match certain groups and characteristics to certain interventions? And what was the main finding of Project Match? All three conditions worked. They pretty much all worked equally well. So talking about God in a church basement to other peers and alcoholics worked every bit as well as the best professionals could offer. And there is a fundamental lesson here. And there is a huge political lesson here about recovery. That recovery does not have to be the domain of professionals with disempowering techniques, exclusionary. It has to be much more about the power of individuals, families, and communities to regenerate. And there's a much stronger social message that for me, it is crucial to, to my career and my work. We're going to be trying to sell you some soap later, but I'll try and sell you my, a couple of my books first. And I think one of the things about doing these kind of events is it's meant to be a kind of retrospective of your career. And I'm going to show various of the people who were illustrative or significant in my journey. This man here is John Booth Davis, who was my PhD supervisor, uh, who is sadly no longer with us. And John Booth Davis was one of those people who first started fundamentally questioning the idea about addiction as something that was quantifiable, simple, measurable. And he did a couple of lovely experiments. So I'm going to quickly describe two experiments that he published. In the first, 20 heroin addicts were interviewed by him as a university professor in a suit uh, and by a fellow heroin addict. The, the order was flipped, 10 got John first, 10 got Roger Baker first. And what do we find? 
With the academic, people reported more frequent heroin use, more problems, more addiction. Does it mean they lied to one or the other? No, that's not the point. People respond to the context they're in. Follow-up study took cigarette smokers, people coming to cigarette uh, cessation clinic, smoking cessation clinic. And they interviewed people twice. And randomly after the first interview, when they came back the second time, the second interview sh schedule had at the top heavy smoker on every page or light smoker on every page. If your questionnaire said light smoker, you reported less cigarettes, less problems, and less illness. If your questionnaire said heavy smoker, you typically reported more cigarettes, more problems, more tobacco dependence. It's context bound, and this is the myth of addiction, that we think we sit in front of professionals and we, we sit in front of clients and, the, and somehow we open a, a drawer in their head and pull out truth. Well, it doesn't work like that. And so I had the joy of working with this guy who was a fascinating social psychologist. And then I started to go and work for these two dubious characters. These two men are, the, on the left is Professor Sir John Strang, and on the right is Professor Michael Gossip. And I had 10 years of insight into the addiction industry. And we were in the kind of knowledge branch of the addiction industry. <clears throat> the South London Maudsley NHS Trust provided uh, addiction treatment for the South Thames region for four and a half million people across South Thames. It was a huge industry. And did people get better? Don't know. Probably not. Lots and lots of people were processed. And we tended to have two outcomes. People who never left our services or people who were in the revolving door in and out of our services. Because we medicated and we provided talking therapies and people would come in once a fortnight for about 40 minutes. And I don't know whether we actually believed we were sprinkling magic dust on their heads, but people did not get better. But it wasn't part of the purpose of what we were doing because the expectations were so low. And around this time, slightly later than this, I went on a, 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 I went to do a series of lectures about uh, recovery in North Wales to specialist treatment staff. Uh, and I, I, before I, I started my presentation, I got all of the staff to estimate what percentage of people who had addiction problems they thought would eventually recover. From around 100 staff, the average estimate was 7%. The evidence we have is 58%. So people were effectively going into services where the staff thought they would fail, that there was a one in 15 chance. And a big part of the recovery movement is the raising of the bar. Because at that time, our expectation was all we can do is keep people alive and keep people out of jail. And it's a self-defeating philosophy. And apart from anything else, it partly explains the incredibly high rates of burnout, stress, and distress among treatment staff. And Michael Gossip, to be fair to him, coined a wonderful phrase called the clinical fallacy. And what he meant by that was, if you sit across your desk from somebody and the only people you see are people who either never leave your service or who are on an annual season ticket in and out, you will think nobody ever recovers because you never see recovery. All you see is failure. And therefore, all you assume exists is failure. Well, the recovery model is about going beyond that and moving beyond the industry to something much, much more ambitious. And I have been incredibly blessed by some of the inspiring figures I have, uh, I have worked with, and I didn't work with the guy on the right, incidentally. Um, but the, 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 the picture of the man on the left, is his name is Stan Cohen. And he was my supervisor for my criminology masters at London School of, of Economics, who wrote a wonderful book called Folk Devils and Moral Panics, which is, and I would strongly recommend, as with the myth of addiction, please read this book which is a very kind of politicized account of how crime is understood, labeled, and uh, categorized. And, and many of the lessons he talks about, mods and rockers, 
are applicable to, to the stigmatization, exclusion, marginalization, and othering of addicts. And for me, this was just a, a real eye-opening experience of academic bravery and incredible intellectual insight. And apart from which, he was a truly phenomenal man. Sadly, when I knew him, he had Parkinson's disease and was not well, but he was still an incredibly inspiring figure. And I'm going to stick with uh, criminology for, for the first two of my own studies that I, I was involved in. And actually, I'm really pleased to say there are people here tonight in the audience who were involved in this programme. Jobs, Friends and Houses is the perfect recovery programme, not least because it pretty much sums up with what we want from recovery, which is jobs, friends and houses. And I should say, one of the things about transitioning from a treatment model to a recovery model is the recognition the end of acute symptomatology is not the end of the course of, of addiction. There's a long window, which I'll come back to, of recovery, which basically involves these core components. And I was very fortunate. Jobs, Friends and Houses was actually set up by a policeman, a police sergeant from Lancashire Police uh, called Steve Hodgkins, who in partnership with HMP Kirkham, essentially offered people in prison the chance to build their own recovery housing. So they started their apprenticeships when they were in prison. And the initial model, although it evolved, was we will uh, buy up derelict rundown houses in Blackpool. And at that time, possibly not now, but at that time, there were an awful lot of rundown derelict houses in Blackpool. We renovate them to a very high standard. Half of them will rent out to people in recovery. Half of them will sell to keep the social enterprise going. And it was a phenomenal process. It genuinely gave people a real sense of hope and possibility. And what did we find in the evaluation we did for the first 50 people who went through jobs, friends and houses, they had a total of 1142 recorded offences between them, an average of 32 per person, a total of 176 imprisonments between them. In the first year of jobs, friends and houses, they, on the police national computer, a total of five recorded offences were identified for that group of 50 people. This represented a 94.1% reduction in offending behaviour. Now, this was not self-reported offending. This was based on police national computer data. This is visionary work which starts with that premise and you know I'm not going to go through the financial details but the key to this study was that basically you provide people with a genuine sense of hope and direction somewhere to live something to do and one of the great quotes we got in the qualitative bit of the study was somebody saying now that I can walk through Blackpool with a hard hat on and muddy boots I can look up and meet people's eyes Previously, I'd walked through Blackpool desperately looking at my shoes, hoping nobody would recognise me from my time involved in crime and addiction. And this is fundamental, because a fundamental part of the recovery process is that change in identity, a change in empowerment, and a change in a sense of purpose. And linked to that, so this was a phenomenal project, and it continues in a much weaker form, but the fundamental lesson is this is recovery that has nothing to do with either traditional criminal justice interventions or traditional addiction intervention. Nobody's getting 45 minutes of blah, blah, blah therapy once a fortnight. And this is HMP Kirkham. HMP Kirkham is a cat D open prison uh, somewhere outside Blackpool, between Blackpool and Preston. And again, I, I, I want to, I mentioned in this second study, which is called the Family Connector Study, and I, I'm always slightly nervous at putting this slide up because it's called KFC for Kirk and Family Connectors. We never got permission from, from um, Colonel Sanders to use his image as part of this, but I just always thought it was a great image to have. And what we did here was when people were six months away from release from prison, we brought family members in and we trained family members up to be human connectors. Their job wasn't to 
provide any kind of therapeutic jo support. Their job was to link people in to employment, training and education, sport, art and recreation, 12-step and mutual aid groups and volunteering opportunities. And we had phenomenal success with this. And this is the same thing about you give people a sense of purpose and a sense of direction, which I currently feel I'm losing because I'm about to try my second video. So my nerves are going up significantly at the moment. And this is not somebody I work beside, but this is somebody who, who I think gave me one of the fundamental insights into addiction. His name is Bruce Alexander, who wrote an amazing book called um, The Globalization of Addiction which suggests that addiction is about a societal change and loss of meaning. Right, let's see if I can do this without screwing it up. Oh, no. Oh, we've got hope, hope is, is here. So have a watch at this video. What causes drug addiction? We think the answer is obvious. Drugs have strong chemicals that make our bodies dependent on them. But journalist Johan Hari discovered that there is more to it. The messages in this video are based on his book, Chasing the Screen, the first and last days of the war on drugs. In the 70s, a research experiment found that when a rat is put in an empty cage, all alone with two water bottles, one normal and one drugged, it gets addicted to the drugged water and eventually dies of malnutrition. The experiment was seen as proof that drugs are uncontrollable and it laid the foundation for 40 years of drug policy with strict laws, rehab centers that focused on withdrawal and a massive war on drugs, making it clear that drugs are bad. What most people don't know is that in the same decade, another scientist, Professor Bruce Alexander, thought it was obvious that lonely rats in boring cages would choose drugs over water. So he put them in a rat park, a lush cage with friends and everything a rat could want, while still having free access to drugs. Surprisingly, his rats chose not to use the drugs. The researcher even took the study one step further and had the rats use drugs for 57 days in the lonely cage until they became heavily addicted and then placed them in the rat park. Astonishingly, the rats gradually reduced their drug use until they stopped using them altogether and lived the rest of their lives drug-free. Experiments like these happen to humans all the time. One example is in hospitals, where heavily injured patients are given a medical form of heroin. This heroin is much stronger than the heroin used by street addicts. Despite months of use, these medical users just stop when they go home to a life where they are surrounded by a loving family. The same drug, used for the same length of time, turns street users who were alone and unhappy into desperate addicts. The Rat Park experiments didn't show that chemical addictions don't exist, but it showed that they are not the only thing that matters in drug abuse. Maybe a person's access to a functioning social life and a lush cage are even more important than continuing the war on drugs mission of making drugs unavailable and penalizing the users. Thank you for watching this mini video series on public health. For easy understanding, we have included some simplifications, so please make sure to check out chasingthescreen.com for the full story and stuartmcmillan.com for an awesome comic strip about the experiments. Please leave your thoughts about the rat park and suggestions for future topics in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe. What causes drug addiction? God, don't start again. Right, good news is, really nice video. Bad news is, all you've got for the rest of the session is me flapping my gums. So, um, for anyone who doesn't know, anyone... There's no way you could do a talk about recovery without giving due credit to the wonderful William White, who is the absolute guru and the historian and the champion of, of recovery research uh, from uh, really over the course of 50 years or so. And I've had the, the, the pleasure and the privilege of working on, with him on a number of the studies that I'm going to be talking about uh, for the remainder of the time here. So 
Many years ago, I worked at the Maudsley, and on a Tuesday afternoon, I used to run a brief assessment clinic. And in that brief assessment clinic, I would have 30 minutes to assess people's suitability for full assessment and then for dose assessment. So what would I do in that 30 minutes? I would have a very short space of time to ask people, Phil, tell me about your drug problems, your family problems, your relationship problems, your physical health problems, your mental health problems, your sexual problems, everything. It was pathologizing. And if Phil said to me, why, you, I'll tell you about my sex problems if you tell me about yours, I'd have said, just answer the fucking question. <laughs> it's an exercise in disempowerment. And it's fundamentally demeaning and humiliating. A recovery model reverses this. A recovery model is about switching, firstly from expert to patient to partnership, but crucially from deficits to strengths. The other thing that is fundamental about recovery, and I'll come back to this in my own model moving forward, is recovery is seen as fundamentally social. Addiction and addiction treatment are intrapsychic and intracorporeal. They happen inside your body and inside your head. Recovery doesn't happen inside your body or inside your head. It happens between people. It is an intrinsically, fundamentally social process. And I will argue it's not just social, but societal, which is why it doesn't happen in clinics. There may be a role for treatment, but recovery isn't about treatment. Recovery is about things that happen in families and communities, and the switch to the social is profound. Likewise, and again to undermine any complex science around this, the fundamental method of transmission of recovery is peer-to-peer, -peer. fundamentally based on the premise of, I want what you have, and I'll do what you do to have what you have. That is why we talk about recovery as a social contagion and a social contagion of hope. Professionals can play a role in this, but it's a secondary role. And look, I'm not for a minute trying to advocate it's only a peer process. You know, the, the, I don't subscribe to the view that to be an undertaker, you have to be dead. But there is a primary and fundamental role for peers in this process. The other thing that challenges traditional scientific notions is, because it's situationally and socially embedded, if I was the perfect heroin detox, it wouldn't matter whether I was in Leeds, Glasgow, Melbourne, New York, it'd be the same. But the perfect recovery process won't be like that because it has to be embedded in the community and society in which it occurs. There are no generalizable universal principles for recovery models, and that makes it harder. But one of the things that is fundamental to a recovery model is what we call the notion of better than well. Why is it not a treatment model? Because the treatment model works in the assumption that when somebody recovers, essentially they are now asymptomatic. I said, we measure deficits. The aim of treatment is the elimination of deficits. The aim of recovery is not the elimination of deficits. It's the building of strengths and the being of better than well. And when we did the life and recovery survey at Sheffield Hallam in 2015 or 2016, um, one of the things we measured was that of people who are long term in recovery, five years or more, 79% of them were actively volunteering in their own local community. Why does this matter? Because the rate of the general public is 39%. So you're twice as likely to be an active contributing member of your community if you're in long-term recovery than if you've never been addicted in the first place. And this is the Hobbesian social contract. It takes around five years to get to stable recovery. What is the payback for society for supporting that post-acute process? You get more active citizens than people who were never addicted in the first place. You get better citizenship. And what do we need to get there? You can phrase it two ways. Jobs, friends, houses, somewhere to live, someone to love, something to do. And, and there's going to be a couple of acronyms in the remainder of the talk. The first one I want to pay very close attention to, the complex scientific term. So first big recovery studies I did in Glasgow and Birmingham, uh, we, we uh, got a group of 198 heroin addicts and alcoholics in recovery. And we tried to work out what were the biggest predictors of well-being in recovery. And there were two things. 
The first was the more time you spent with other people in recovery. Well, that fits the social contagion of recovery. The second was the more you did stuff, the more time you spent in the last month doing those things. So Goya, get your pens and papers ready. Goya stands for get off your arse. The more you do, the better you do. And we get challenged for this. We get challenged for this on the grounds that are you sure it's not the case that people who have higher well-being then uh, engage in more activity? So we followed people for a year in three English drug action team areas, and the results were conclusive. People who started meaningful activities reported significant improvements in physical, psychological well-being and quality of life. People who stopped meaningful activities reported decreases in these things. It's not a causal effect. It's not a randomized trial, but it's not far away. And the other thing I, I said at the start, one of the big criticisms for me was this sense of recovery was perceived as kind of wishful thinking. And so the bulk of my career for the last 15 years has been, the, has been based on the introduction of a concept that actually dates back to 1999 from Granfield and Cloud, who defined recovery as the breadth and depth of internal and external resources uh, that can be drawn upon to initiate and sustain recovery from alcohol and other drugs. And it seemed to me that what that offered was not just a transition to a strength-based model. And you'll notice that the, the internal and external meant it stopped being embodied. It started being stuff that was out there that you could draw upon. But for me, the crucial point about this was to, we started to say, here is the basis for a metric. We can now start counting stuff that allows us to measure where people are in this process, in this journey. And uh, along with an American researcher called Alexandra Lodi in 2010, uh, we, we, we had a paper published by the Royal Society for the Arts um, where we started trying to quantify th this, this model. Uh, and, and we started to say, look, the ultimate aim is the slice of the pie in the top left. We want to build these internal characteristics, self-esteem, self-efficacy, resilience, coping skills, communication skills. But flipping around the treatment model, how do people build them over the five years of their recovery journey with the other two slices of the pie? And to use a brutal mixed metaphor, the other two slices of the pie provide scaffolding around a person. I don't know, you can make pies with scaffolding. Anyway, the other two slices of the pie provide the scaffolding, social support and access to community resources that afford people the space and opportunity to develop those internal characteristics. So we started thinking, how do you get people to have access to those things. If you live in a rough estate in Peckham or you live in a rough estate in Glasgow, how do you get access to those things? And one of them was for us to start with was about how do you get people into mutual aid groups? So going back to the Nasty Boo Maudsley Hospital, we conducted a randomized control trial in 2012 and Victoria Manning was a PhD student of mine. And we, we, took a, uh, we had a unit called the Acute Assessment Unit, which was a 10-day emergency cleanup ward. Nobody got treated really. It was people who were injecting in their necks, injecting in their groins, who were fitting. All we were doing was cleaning people up and stopping them dying. And we ran that we took 153 people and randomly assigned them to three conditions. First group of people got leaflets telling them where all the 12 step meetings were in the ward. And the aim of the study was to say, can you attend at least one 12 step meeting while you're on the hospital grounds? Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous. Group two, the booking in doctor encouraged them to attend. Group three, a peer came, talked to them beforehand, took them to a meeting, took them for a coffee afterwards, talked about what had happened. In the peer-based condition only, there was more meeting attendance while they were on the ward. There was more meeting attendance in the three months after they left the ward. There was less heroin, alcohol, and cocaine use in the three months after they left the ward. There are three key conclusions from this study. One, Giving people leaflets is the pointless abuse of dead trees. Two, and apologies to any medics who might be in the room, a doctor is only marginally more useful than a dead tree. Conclusion three, peers taking someone to a meeting massively changes the light, and we call this the assertive linkage condition. But what it does is, as in the Kirkham Family Connector study, is give us a hint as how you build social capital. And the other hint about this is, it's what we call the helper principle. 
that if you are the person who does that guiding and taking, they may benefit, but you will definitely benefit because it changes your self-image and your self-efficacy and your self-esteem. The next person in my journey here is Professor Dan Lubman. And Professor Dan Lubman and I were involved in a, a, a significant study. So uh, in 2011, I moved to Australia and I worked to, uh, uh, in the medical school at, at Monash University for three years. Uh, and we got a large Australian Research Council randomized control trial, uh, sorry, large uh, grant to look at recovery processes over time. And what we developed here was a model called the social identity model of recovery. We took 300 people as they entered one of four, five uh, therapeutic communities in the east coast of Australia. And we baseline followed them up at six months and 12 months. And essentially what we showed here was that changes in people's identity was strongly predictive of their outcomes over time. This was a fundamental shift in how we understood the model of recovery. And for us, that process of identity change was fundamental to understanding how people change their recovery model. And the other acronym I'm going to just ask you to quickly remember is CHIME. And CHIME fundamentally underpins how recovery works. Recovery starts with connectedness. Connectedness to other people, it's a fundamental human process that generates hope. If you can do it, I can do it. And the hope then becomes the fuel that generates meaningful activities, that provokes identity change and creates empowerment. And our, our, our social network study fundamentally illustrated this. And I'm going to just mention briefly uh, a couple of other people who were fundamental to this process. So, so uh, on the left-hand side is the sadly no longer with us Rowdy Yates. On the right-hand side is Eric Allen, who is a, 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 a manager of therapeutic communities in Australia. And both of them were fundamental to us developing this model that was essentially about how recovery emerges through a process of connectedness generating hope but that this was fundamentally linked to how people shifted their identity. The biggest predictor of the SONAR study of positive outcomes was identity change. Identity change was crucial and was fundamental to this process. But it all generated, it all started from connection. Over the course of the last 15 years, I've collected around 3,500 recovery stories in Scotland, England, Wales, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and America. And the one thing they all have in common is connection. Nobody recovers alone. Not one of the 3,500 stories. It's a fundamentally social process. Um, so, yes, I am... Oh. So, sorry, if anyone got hopeful I was finished there, no chance. <laughs> There's days to go. So, my academic mentor and the person who I've learned most from probably in the last 10 or 15 years is this man, whose name is uh, Professor John Braithwaite who was the founder of the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the Australian National University, who in 2022 published his kind of major work called Macro Criminology and Freedom. And he got very interested. He, he, he was an expert in restorative justice about collective processes for resolving offending and crime issues. But he got very interested in this idea of, uh, of recovery capital, and he argues in Macrocriminology and Freedom that recovery capital, restorative capital, and social capital are not like financial capital. Financial capital, you spend it, sadly, as we all know, you've got less of it at the end. What he pointed out was with restorative capital, recovery capital, and social capital, the more you use it, the more you have. It's generative, not depleting or are diminishing. And for me, this really took me to the next stage of my academic journey, which was not only is recovery a social process, every time recovery happens between people, it leaves residual benefit in the community. It ripples out. The contagion is not just person to person. The contagion is much broader than that. It has benefits that exceed this. And I'm going to very quickly shoot through some stuff of technically boring things that I do. 
So I have developed measures. So this is called the REC cap. And the, the REC cap is a, a measure of recovery capital that is now uh, used in five US states. And we have now got more than 20,000 completed REC cap forms um, that allows us to quantify, measure, and track recovery capital progress. So it's no longer just a concept. It's something we can count and we can predict with. And we will, we hope we will be getting a developing a partnership between Leeds Trinity University and Get Help, who are the IT company who have developed this online system. So with my questionnaire, which people can now do on their phones or on their laptops, as soon as you complete it and hit the submit button, you will get a traffic lighted score profile like this that also links to what you do next. So we no longer treat this as research. This is action. So whatever your score profile is, it will generate a recovery care planning model for you that tells you what you should do over the next 90 days. And it allows us then to start to say at collective and group levels, and you'll see the numbers on there are big, we can start to map across large populations what the expected levels of change in recovery capital are, what the reductions in barriers are, the reductions in unmet needs are, over periods of time as people engage in peer-based recovery support services. And all of the people on here are either in therapeutic communities or recovery housing. So they are people who are engaging in recovery support services. And we then have an underpinning. This is a learning management system that allows us to continue to train. And a big part of my model now is that any recovery intervention has to be transmissible peer to peer. And when we developed the REC cap, it was fundamentally developed as a peer based model. Now, I don't have a clue what this slide means, but it's just beautiful. Actually, no, this is a systematic review that uh, a PhD student of mine at the University of Dundee, Adela Bonaccio, has just published, which basically shows all of the possible domains of recovery capital uh, as the spokes and the rungs are the each of the each of the published instruments. And as you will see, so this is another shameless advert. The REC cap, which is the outer ring, covers more domains of recovery capital than any other recovery measure. And we are now using this to predict retention in recovery residences changes in recovery capital profile. And the third thing that we're now doing is started to use it as an evaluation tool to assess the effectiveness of interventions. So we've been working in this wonderful jail called Chesterfield County Jail in Virginia. And in Chesterfield County Jail, we have a, a, a bizarre phenomenon where people, once they are released from jail into recovery residences in Virginia, continue to go back into the jail on a weekly basis to continue their engagement with the therapeutic community. And they act as guides. They keep replacing each other as guides to bring people out and support them through. And in spite of the fact, for anyone as old as me, the sheriff who runs this bears an uncanny resemblance to Boss Hogg in the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> it is a genuinely democratic therapeutic community. So people who engage in the therapeutic community, choose who gets let, allowed in and choose who gets chucked out. The, the officers have no say in this. It is a democratic therapeutic community in a jail. It is a wonderful program. And uh, Sheriff Leonard has provided the most astonishing freedom to, to, to create this recovery model. <coughs> As I said, we now have roughly 20,000 completed rec cap forms. And you can see we now have an anticipated trajectory of growth for people entering rec peer based recovery support services, which show not only significant initial gains, but also show sustainable gains over time for people who are retained. Now, if you were to show a similar map for treatment, you would show equivalent gains in the first six months dropping off after that point, attrition of benefit is the standard pattern post six months in treatment services, but not here. But we also know it's not an equal world that in, in Granfield and Cloud published a paper in 2008, which was largely conceptual, where they basically said there are four things that are negative recovery capital. Don't shoot me as the messenger, but being female was one of them. Recovery is harder for women. 
Being older is, is negative recovery capital. Having a history of serious mental illness and having a history of imprisonment. Now, what we have shown with our 20,000 people is having one of those four factors, which is the orange line, really doesn't matter that much. But by the time you are up to all four of those negative recovery capital factors, which is the pale blue line at the bottom, you start with lower recovery capital and you don't re uh, regain that deficit. And so there is a massive work for us to do to start to say, to move away from that world where we assume that the science of recovery and recovery capital, which is primarily based on working class, white male heroin addicts and drinkers, can be extended and challenged and changed. And I'm not unaware of the fact that all of those key significant fi uh, figures in my career are middle-aged or old white men. And I am really hoping that for my PhD students, that won't be the case. There'll be a much greater diversity. Um, and the world recovery capital innovation continues. We are now developing a short-term measure uh, called the RCS 36, is a brief screening tool, which people can again do online, and which leads to a different kind of, of intervention. So I have with me, Playing cards, playing cards, which are the intervention for how you map and assess where you are on your recovery journey. Oh, I threw them away. Uh, post the, uh, while you go through that mapping and processing your recovery. Now, the, the, this I'm going to be slightly disloyal to my home city, and I, I am conscious of time, so I will finish in the next five minutes. Um, this. No, does anyone hazard a guess to what city this is? Because it's a city in disguise. Don't be put off by the fact it's not raining and the sun is shining. This is Glasgow. This is Glasgow uh, next to the Clyde in uh, Glasgow Green. Uh, this is 2010. And this was the second UK recovery walk. Uh, and astonishingly, there were 2,000 people in the middle of Glasgow, there was no drinking, there was no drug use, and there was no fighting. None of these had ever been recorded in a Saturday in Glasgow before. That's incredibly disloyal, I shouldn't say. Anyway, this is a public celebration of recovery. And one of the, the key points that I wanted to make tonight is the transition of the recovery world. And what I see is three phases. The first phase was recovery as an anonymous set of fellowships held in church basements, deliberately kept away, secretive, quiet, highly effective as Project Matt showed. But recovery was something stigmatizing, quiet, to, to be kept away from your external identity. About 10 or 15 years ago, we started to get recovery community organizations appearing in, in the United States. And the last 10 years or so, like Five Ways in Leeds, Recovery, uh, lived experience recovery organizations emerging in the UK. The beginning of coming out of the closet, the beginning of a public movement of recovery. Events like this do something fundamentally different. And for me, there are seven purposes to this kind of public event. So the first one, to celebrate the astonishing achievement of recovery. It's a good enough reason in itself. Secondly, we have 2,000 people from all over the UK here. Bring people together, create bonding capital, share new social connections. Thirdly, there were lots of people not in recovery who were in Glasgow Green at that time who were asking what was going on here. Third purpose, challenge social exclusion, stigmatization by the general public. Fourthly, for people not yet at this point, to demonstrate that A, recovery is possible, and B, that recovery is attractive. Fifthly, among all these people in their, enjoying themselves on the day are two dull white middle-aged fat men, me and Fergus Ewing, who was the Scottish Communities Minister at the time. What's the fifth purpose is political influence. We got the Scottish Communities Minister to come along, open the event and walk with us. Why is this important? Because it creates that political visibility and buy-in that recovery is something meaningful and purposeful. Sixth, and now we move to the, 
societal model of recovery. It creates an extra public event in the calendar of the city. It creates something for Glasgow that's nothing to do with recovery. And as a consequence, seven, it creates two different kinds of social capital, uh, linking and bridging social capital that brings together new populations and challenges some of those exclusions, because part of the purpose is to create that sense of connection. And so the, the next stage of our recovery movement is around inclusive recovery cities. The inclusive recovery cities, and I'm delighted to say that Leeds is one of 10 British inclusive recovery cities now. And next month, we will have a recovery advent calendar, an online recovery advent calendar where eight cities from across the UK have each contributed three stories that we'll put online every day. There'll be a message of inspiration and hope about how I got through my first sober Christmas and how I can help you to do the same. Inspiring, providing that connection, but the whole model is predicated on the idea that recovery is not just social, but recovery is about is societal, whatever you want to call it, paying forward, giving back, contributing, that sense of excluded, marginalized populations being part of something huge. I can't be bothered talking about another research study. Um, <laughs> And we started this in, it, with an event in Middlesbrough in May at the Riverside Football Stadium. And we are continuing to build this model of connectedness, inspiration, social enterprise and hope. The fundamental aim of which is threefold. To challenge stigma and exclusion. Two, to create new connections and opportunities for people in recovery. Three, to make Middlesbrough or Leeds or Blackpool better places, not just for the recovery community, but for everyone. And this is a message that has really gathered hope. So we now have 14 cities in the Balkans signed up as recovery cities. I've got a call next week with Cape Town in South Africa as a recovery city. This is genuinely a message about redemption and hope. And it fits very well, I think, with, our, with, with what we are attempting to do here and with LTU's social mission about fundamental social justice and giving back. But fundamentally, this is a personal story of transition and change that links a, a, a set of core concepts essential to the notion of one, people can change. Two, they can change in positive ways if they are supported and not blocked from doing so. And three, that that change has huge public contribution to make. Thank you very much. I've got some notes here. But wow. Just wow. Yeah. That, that was excellent, right? Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we live in a country where the government wants to tell us a lot that social science is wishy-washy subject and social science education is wishy-washy subject. That was some of the most excellent social science having a real positive impact on lives and societies. Excellent stuff. Thank oh, you. Thank you. I, I've made some, I was, I was told to make some notes about reflections. <laughs> I've done that. There's massive overlaps with many of our work here, but I don't want to take the time. Please, if you've got a question, you've got a comment you want to make, please stick your hand up and somebody will come to you with a microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, um, first of all, so my name, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Steve Johnson, Professor of Business and Innovation um, at here, here at LTU. Um, and I, just to echo Alex's words, first of all, wonderful, thank you. And thank you for raising the bar impossibly high for those of us who are still to give our professorial <laughs> lectures. But certainly, you know, it's... It, it, um, Alex is absolutely right that, that, that there are uh, there are implications all across and including in 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 my field business and innovation. My my question was was particularly really I was very taken by and forgive me if I get the the wrong words but certainly the peer intervention and and, and peer um, peer support model which I think is applicable across a whole host of um, 
um, host of realms. My question very much is, is, is about um, research and to what extent do those peers, those people who've gone through the addiction and recovery process, are there any examples of those people actually becoming researchers and actually moving through that um, through that process? Because I think we talk a lot about co-creation, and I think it will be really interesting to see not just the, the, you know, the gender and ethnic mix um, improving, if you don't mind me saying, um, but also seeing people with that lived experience going into, um, into research. Yeah, so I, I'm going to use this excuse to answer your question and ask, answer a question you didn't ask. Um, so the first point, I, I, I have 10 PhD students. I'm not going to name any names, but there are a combination of people who are in recovery among them, and family members of people in recovery, and I, I would I would estimate that of all of my peer reviewed publications, probably forty or fifty of them include at least one person who was a participant in the study as part of this, and it's been very much an aim of our work. David Patton and myself worked on a, 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 an ESRC grant. And we, we tried to, we created a website so that people could help us interpret the findings and could put their interpretations in. Co-production is absolutely fundamental. And look, you know, the, the, it, it would be completely hypocritical of, of me not to do that. In, in 2013, the question didn't ask. Um, that was, that there was a, a review of what works in recovery. And it was undertaken by Keith Humphreys, who's a professor at Yale. And, and he basically came up with three things. The three things that work in recovery are 12-step and other forms of peer-based mutual aid, Oxford housing, which is peer recovery residences, and peer-delivered interventions. So everything that we know that's got an unequivocal evidence base is predicated on peers. I think for for... I can, and I, I, I kind of regard myself now pretty much as a research activist rather than, and I, I, certainly the days, and I'm very pleased, the days of doing double blind, double dummy trials in an inpatient ward are way behind me. And I wouldn't start, attempt to pretend I was starting from any position of objectivity. For me, this is, this is, this is really about challenging academic tropes and, and developing new methods as much as anything else. Sorry, we've got a question over here. I'll do my job again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good. 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 And there is clear hope here. And I think just to reiterate, the clear uh, influence your research and evidence-based approach is having on practical change is absolutely powerful. And you know, in Blackpool, we have uh, we've mentioned a lot about job rates and houses, although it, it continues in a smaller form, but it continues. Nicky and myself are directors, Stephen is a product of job trends and houses, and actually that's fundamental to us. We are, um, in terms of the contagion of COVID, the stuff that, we, that inspires us the most is, is now when we talk about the recovery cities. And Blackpool, uh, you know, we want to be part of that very much so. And I think the thing that really, what you've done, you've changed the narrative. The narrative of people in recovery being people who are in need, in need of service and support. Actually, our towns and cities are better and will be better because we have this huge <coughs> army of people in recovery who are passionate with fire in the belly to make change. All that figure that about 79% in terms of involving volunteering. So I think that the contagion of hope comes from actually we're telling a new story that Blackpool is and will be a better place precisely because we have people in recovery. And I think that is what really inspires us. And I think you've captured that wonderfully. And so thank you. Thanks very much, mate. Um, <clears throat> so we've got the evidence. I mean, all this is empirical, all this is researched. I guess my question is, 
how do we get this into policy? How do we get this into changing services? You know, what I see repeatedly is the academic research is here and society is dragging its heels 30 years behind most of the time. Uh, look, and uh, you're trying to get me into trouble, Graham, but I will nonetheless go for it. Um, I, I can't believe, we, for people who are not familiar with drug policy, we had something called the Dame Carol Black Review Parts 1 and 2, which made very, very strong uh, pronouncements about two things. One, the importance of lived experience as part of the process and policy development. Two, the importance of funding and supporting recovery organisations. Somehow, the step between that and the publication of From Harm to Hope, the government drug strategy, there has been lots of that seems somehow not to get translated. And without wishing to sound paranoid, it feels to me like the existing forces of the traditional treatment models manage to continually, at the, at the point at which money starts being mentioned, get recovery taken out. Now, this is not a universal process. So in America, there is a clear ring fencing. Every state now has a ring fence. So I think it's 7% of all state budgets for addiction have to go to recovery services. There is no ring fence in Britain. There is no commitment that any of the, uh, sorry, in England, there is no commitment that any of the government monies will be spent specifically on recovery. And we can we keep hearing about treatment and recovery services where uh, when I worked in Australia, there was a term that was used called spray on recovery, which drug workers got the names of their offices changed to recovery workers. And that was pretty much the extent of it. And there's kind of been a sense that that has happened where the money is concerned. So I don't want to, to end on a sour note, but I completely, I, I find it very frustrating. I don't think we do have enough evidence. I think we're still in the early days of recovery evidence. But it seems to me that the story is captivating, not because of me, that those long-term opportunities to prove better than wellness I think justifies a much greater level of investment than is currently offered, particularly at a time when the amount that gets spent on treatment is going up and up and up in the UK. I think that did okay for diplomacy there. Hi, um, I live in Manchester. Uh, I'm not an academic. I'm interested in this sort of thing. What can I do to support this cause, this activism cause, if we're calling it that, um, in social spaces in Manchester, being new to that scene, not involved in addiction um, treatment, that recovery centres and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, what can the average person do, whether it's on the recovery city side or the actual clinical, like helping outside, that makes the most difference, like people on the ground? Oh, I, I think for me, the first thing is just spread the message, get the message out there through social media or whatever. Get involved in one of our recovery cities. Find out what's going on in Manchester. I don't know where, where Manchester is in terms of recovery cities models. Uh, we need people who champion this cause. And, you know, the, 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 the fundamental driver has to be peers. But the, the, for the model to succeed, we need an alliance of four key groups. We need people in recovery, we need family members, we need professionals, and we need members of the general public. All four of them have a critical role to play in challenging some of those things. You know, come along to some of the Leeds Inclusive Recovery Cities events, park runs, whatever we're doing next, you know, be a part of it. Take part in some of the stuff that's going on in Middlesbrough, Blackpool. Come to our event in Blackpool in December on December the... No, it's February that... Well, I can't remember. Okay. 7th of February. Yeah, come to our event in Blackpool. It's not too far for us. Train journey from Manchester. Come along to that event. Uh, hi, my name's Sally. Um, I'm in recovery from alcohol uh, about three and a half years now. Um, just building really on Graham's question, um, looking at what barriers we face, because I truly believe that the research is out there, the evidence is clear. Uh, the recap model, the way that it can be used to assess and uh, show impact um, is amazing. And I thank you for your work internationally. Um, and I thank you for bringing that to our fellow peers here. If we're facing barriers, um, 
we need to consider collaboration um, and government partnerships. You mentioned about the ring fencing of money for recovery services. So sorry, Magdalena, but just <laughs> with the 267 million that was uh, released yesterday, is there going to be a plan for Leeds? I'm only interested in Leeds that some of that money will be ring fenced so that we can put these in things in place. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I suspect the answer is no, it won't be. <laughs> but yes, thank you for making the point. Um, just to, in terms of the recovery, uh, sorry, the um, medical and treatment model, which is pretty widespread across the NHS addiction services, which is often the case, and the, uh, the case is often that it is completely disempowering, that it can perpetuates the cycle, um, that often references to kind of peer support programs are, are very much a I have a leaflet, which we know how helpful leaflets can be. Is there any, um, have, have there been any trials of a, a slightly different model in terms of the, the NHS services offered? Or is it more that kind of, and, and I do appreciate that there is value, significant value to the treatment and medical model at times, but also it's kind of strengthening the collaboration between the peer support yeah. model too but yeah i just wondered if there had been any any trial or any kind of evidence or, or, or anything in um that would potentially show the benefits of that in nhs services i mean the, the first thing i guess to dispel as a myth is that the nhs provide many services now in england since uh privatization of treatment services about 15 years ago uh there are very few nhs run services the majority of services in england are now run by large charities and um, so there are three or four large charities and one of the one of the challenges is the preferred model is a single provider so all of the money in a local area goes through one single provider who then has the option of redistributing and subcontracting it the 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 loss of nhs services in england was partly a consequence of what was seen as a bloated uh, treatment system and a treatment process. Towards the end of my time, when I was at the National Treatment Ag Agency, I got seconded to the Prime Minister's delivery unit uh, as part of a team doing a, what was called a priority review of drug treatment effectiveness. And we had as part of that team, somebody from the Treasury who was just astonished and appalled at the wastage that went on in NHS treatment services. And that partly led to the privatization of the systems, which doesn't really answer your question. There is massive natural variability within England in, in the quality of, of treatment services. And here in Leeds, we are fortunate to have one of the better treatment systems. But the, the, the alternative approaches really are about those kind of integrated models that are, are really about stopping people getting into treatment. For me, recovery should be before treatment. It shouldn't be an after treatment thing. The idea of having recovery as a community-based model that champions prevention and early intervention through peer delivery in communities is much more effective than a reactive center-based system. Many years ago when I started, last thing I'll say on this, when I started working in Birmingham, I had a team of five assistant psychologists working for me. And what we did was we got them to sit in in a single session of every single client in any of the specialist NHS services in, in Birmingham. And what we found was that in the typical 45 minutes of a therapeutic session, nine minutes could be described as anything like an evidence-based psychological therapy, which equates to 18 minutes a month or just under four hours a year. The evidence base for talking therapies is typically predicated on six hours of delivery a week, not four hours a year. So the whole notion of that, and I got accused of kind of doing an emperor's new clothes thing with this, but it struck me that the model was effectively fundamentally flawed, partly by funding and partly by a complete misunderstanding of what change in recovery is. And it, it seems to be there are, there are clear places for acute clinical services, but it feels to me it's the cart before the horse. We should have community-based peer-driven recovery support services with 
specialist treatment as a kind of last resort beyond that. Thank you for that that that, that excellent uh, talk, David. I, I was struck that while you you were talking about addiction and addiction recovery services, the the things you said were illustrative of social problems throughout throughout society. We spend so much time and an incredible amounts of money pushing social problems around and punishing people for the problems that they face as a result of disadvantage. And wouldn't it be better? if we just started with friends, jobs and houses, uh, rather than trying to invent them after the fact. But well, I thought that was an excellent talk. Thank you very, very much. And you have indeed raised the bar somewhat high. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Alex. Um, can I just say on a personal note, I've known David for about 20 years. We met at the National Treatment Agency. We both worked there. And uh, to be honest, up until tonight, I didn't really know what the fuss was about. But <laughs> I think I think that um, sorry, um, no, it's been an absolute privilege to be here tonight to listen to David, and it's a privilege to work with him on a daily basis. I think I can genuinely say this: not only is he a world class academic, as an as as a colleague, as a friend, um, he's he's a fantastic mentor, he's a fantastic support to uh, colleagues within the university, and I think uh, we would all agree that he's a fantastic asset. To have at Leeds Trinity. So what I would say is that that's it. Thank you for that, David. The the bar has been raised, but the next person to take up the challenge is Professor Lee Hoth, and she will be doing her inaugural in December. So if you can join us, please do. The details on the website. But other than that, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's joined us in person and also online. If you're lucky enough to be here in person, not only can you buy some soap, from our, our friend up there, but also you can have a chat to, to speak to David, but you can join us for a reception in the atrium. So thank you for tonight and thank you, David.